It's okay. I once had a hero complex too. I know the stomach-clenching fear of not being needed, the dismal dawn of a day when no one asks for anything. An hour spent on yourself feels wasted, so you compulsively pour yourself out for others until there's nothing left of you. But there is a better way, dear knight. You can learn to give when you have extra, not because you're afraid people won't want you if they don't need you. You can be self-sacrificing when there is a genuine need, rather than to boost your self-esteem. A princess worth pursuing would bust your chops if you tried to save her to salvage your waning self-worth. And perhaps, by saving her, you deprive her of the ability to grow. She must slay her own dragons on her journey to herself. There's nothing shameful in your fragile ego, but it doesn't make you a hero to compensate for it with audacious acts. You can just be you. You have intrinsic worth. You don't have to prove anything. There is a happily ever after for you, codependent knight. There is someone you can save, and only you are able. You can save yourself. The hardest struggle, the noblest battle, is the one fought inside. And you can win. I need my water. I'll be right back. I believe Vertigo told us that we are okay to perform the uh, slam pieces that are in the anthology. Um, so that's another, uh, that's a prop for the anthology. Um, Six dollars helps us go to nationals. So I will read the pieces that I have in here. There might not be a lot of poetry in finance. Few write sonnets about their savings accounts or a dirge for their debit card. But I tell you, if my direct deposit stopped, I would compose a mournful ode. Maybe more poets would, would balance their checking accounts if a chat book instead of a calculator were required. My boss wants me to make banking easy, but maybe we can make banking poetry. If you can count the syllables in your haiku, can you count your credit card receipts? Organize them into stacks, five, seven, and five. Money makes the world go round, and we poets never seem to have any. So we watch the planet spin by, jingling the last two quarters in our pockets. Trust me, when I handle more money in a day than I make in a year or five, I know. Make banking poetry. Put a check register as a centerfold in your newly published chat book. Think of your monthly statements as an epic poem from the mountaintops of payday down into the lows of multiple overdrafts. There's always a lovely siren urging disastrous behavior in epics, so steer clear of enticements to sabotage yourself with high interest credit. The much feared enemies are the fluorescent lighted payday lenders who prey on the vulnerable in their hour of need. Honest financiers to the rescue, they ride in on a white receipt instead of a white horse. Oh, let's make banking poetry. Luscious, crisp, tangy, sweetness so pungent I don't notice the juice dripping down my chin. I have been waiting all day to peel back the layers and bury my face into this orange. Anticipation heightens every sense and I'm ready, so ready. I pull back the outer layer expecting the promised taste and then whap! Bitter. Tough, chewy lining. The meager juice munches sourly down my chin. This intruder caught me completely unaware, unsuspecting in my enticement. The betrayal. The betrayal of a dry orange. Dry oranges come from grocery stores, roadside stands, and sometimes churches. The dry orange religious pretenders talk of spiritual ecstasy so sweet that listeners may not notice their own saliva dripping down their chins. It's so easy, they promise. Repeat after me and God will bless you. Oh, it smells so good. Just let me sink my teeth into it. As they spray the crowd with orange-scented air freshener. 
These simple steps are the only way to God, the citrus preachers promise. Give your money to me that God's work continues. Mandarin memories seep in around the doors and windows of my mind. Jesus loves you, so you have to do what I say. My tongue trembles for tangerine. They prop themselves up as gatekeepers, doormen in the house of God. They assure us that spiritual bliss is a few memorized Bible verses away and then put the blame on their followers when paint by numbers faith doesn't pan out. To many, they smell as tantalizing as a box of Spanish mandarins, but inside they disappoint like the betrayal of a dry orange. No one needs a secret key to commune with God or an introducer to explore the divine mysteries. Listening to the sacred can be as simple as sitting silently. Maybe your understanding of God is more like a peach or an apple, and oranges, however sweet they can be, leave you nauseated. Don't believe a religious con polishing a capricious citrus. Find the fruits of your faith. Thank you. I need a drink before this one. <laughs> well, it's the next one in the, in the chat book, too. As had a suggestion? You had. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah, go ahead. You write your fruity pebbles. <laughs> Fucking free the people. Big white letters scrawled in dripping spray paint across the back wall of my church. The graffiti scribbler probably hasn't heard of progressive Christianity. Most in my congregation are battle-scarred refugees from evangelical confirmation camps, bearing fresh wounds from weekly rounds of condescending Jesus metaphors. We shudder, seeing the slumped shoulders of the next generation, our backs only recently straightening up after releasing the load of judgment. Fucking free the people? Hell yes. Free us from the vice grips of fear-based sacrificial atonement when historical Christianity rarely traveled just one improbable, reproachable path. The only thing narrow about Jesus' way is the difficulty the rich and powerful have in following it. Our society's wealth makes so many incapable of sharing the welcome the man from Nazareth extended to the poor, sick, and outcast. But we will find each other. We will heal one another. Fuck, we will free the people. We will free the people from dogmatic creeds and top dog televangelists, obsessed with the brand name on someone else's holy book, and worrying we distribute too many condoms and not enough chick tracks. My confession of faith is a declaration that our untamable God will not be shoehorned into a box the size of a hymnal, pulpit, or megachurch stadium. When I repent, it is not for people I have fucked, contraceptives I have swallowed, or cleavage I have displayed. I do not confess guiltily to having questions and doubts about my faith, because the source of love would never chastise someone for pondering why. I do confess the times I have averted my discomforted gaze from a terminally ill person with bed sores. The days I hoped no one would make me think about race because I wanted to marinate in my white privilege. I repent of the times when my mind churned into a pool of disgust rather than compassion for the old beggar asking for coffee and a cigarette. Free the people from the church, for the church, by the church. Fuck the free people when they forget to free others. Free the fucking people from clouds of invented shame. Just fucking free the people. Hand me that spray paint. Under this graffiti, I'm writing, we're working on it. Will you help? Thank you. Was this gentleman over here ready to perform soon? I'm sure I'll be back up here at the mic. You can, if you hang around long enough, you'll just hear me again. But we want to hear you too. Woo! And I'm terribly sorry I have forgotten your name. I've seen you performing. You're awesome, and that much I remember. 
Yes, welcome to the mic, the mystery man who is incredible. Hi, everybody doing? My name is Frost. Have my book. It's called Frostbitten. And then the first one thing I'm gonna read is Life in Simple Form. When I was 19, I had numerous conversations with my grandfather. His life stories and wisdom gave me a sense of who I am. He used to tell me that our lives were made to serve God, find something he was passionate with and make a career out of it, and touch as many lives as possible. I thought he was just talking gibberish, but I listened to every word. Some of his stories seemed far-fetched and amusing. I kept, it kept me going, especially when I was going through hell. He would have lost his mind to know that his oldest grandson tried to commit suicide that time. The funny thing is, after I failed, I went to visit him. He told me that by the time I turned 40, I would look back at my life and say, hey, I still have some goals to accomplish. There are some lives that need to be touched. And when he died, he had a funeral fit for a war vet, politician, Virgil Brown, Stanley Tolliver, and many others were there. In the midst of my sleep apnea sessions, I was amazed to see so many people. He touched so many lives. He was my hero, my big fish. I still have his flag. Just the mention of his name alone got me jobs back then. Over the last 20 years, I've tried to live by those three simple rules. From East Cleveland to Cleveland poetry, I can honestly say that I've built many win-win relationships. The lives I've touched can and will pass on. Even if I cross someone, I pray all is forgiven. <laughs> Love your dear friends. I've tried to share my crazy life stories of wisdom with my siblings, younger cousins, children, nieces, and nephews. I went from being the bum of the family to owning my own business, achieving a master's degree, losing weight, sharing my talents with the world, and marry a beautiful woman. <laughs> Only a select few know my story. I felt the need to share my life in the book in hopes that other can possibly gain some sort of strength and share their testimony. From the child abuse, mental setbacks, morbid obesity, heart attack, and other experiences, I can say that at 40, I've accomplished a lot. And I still have goals to accomplish and lives to touch. <laughs> call this one Highness. Memories have an un uncanny way of sending messages. Ah, let me start that over. Memories have an uncanny way of sending you back to a dark and shallow place where pain dwells, refusing to let you forget the mind is the devil's playground. Just when you think you're over all the pain in your past, he walks up and asks, hey, don't you remember that time when you're Dad used to telephone to beat your head. He didn't even take you to the hospital right away. Instead, he just let you sit there and suffer for a while. <laughs> what an asshole. Your memories somehow get the best of you and you start to remember other things that cause so much pain. Your mind is lost in a whirlwind of anger and hate. The devil is laughing. He has right where he wants you, unable to forget. And as the devil brings up more memories, you get so mad that you want to curse your father and everyone else who inflicted pain, inflicted pain in your life. But your father's gone, and everyone else probably don't even remember what they said. And anyway, you forgave them a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, you know all about the phrase, it's easy to forgive and forget. And not forgetting can be your downfall. That ball and chain that keeps you from moving on with life 
You may not be able to forget all the bad memories, but life gives you a chance to make new and improved ones. Even though the battle scars will constantly remind you of your past, you're still standing stronger than ever before because you let God be your mental, physical, and spiritual shield. With him by your side, you've battled all your inner demons. You've turned all your bad memories into testimonies. Your light can help others and get over your past. You are a conqueror. In fact, you're more than a conqueror. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm gonna do two more. This one's called The Mars, The Moon, and The Stars. I'm just a man who often dreams on the moon with enough sense to know that it's not made of blue cheese. Sometimes my dreams turn into nightmares and I have a hard time sleeping. No sleeps bring out the weary of me and sometimes it may seem like self-doubt, but it's not. I often gaze into the stars at night connecting the dots as if the Lord is sending me some kind of code that would give me more insight. This life has its ups and downs. There are more downs, but they've all been conquered. God gave me the strength to do so. I often wonder how much would it take to ship my mind from Mars, maybe the moon and the stars. I would risk it all to regain what's rightfully mine. Maybe, it would take, maybe it's a waste of time, but maybe they're better off there. My dreams are safer there. My Mars, Venus lives there. She longs for my smile, my hugs, and my kiss. My heart dwells there, and she keeps it near her, but she doesn't have enough duct tape to keep it mended. The world has a tendency to use it as target practice. I can't sleep when the stars continue to fall. They make so much noise. That discouraging, that, that they discourage my pathway back to her. So close yet so far, because I'm standing on Mars, losing peace of mind. Damn those noisy stars. Maybe a Louisville slugger may do the trick. Batter up. Swinging until my mind is at ease again, so she can crush my heart again, so I can sleep again, so I can dream again. Okay. Okay, this was called Poetic Love Play. I love her like my first pair of Jordans when they were Nikes. Poppy Willies on 10 speed bikes. I kiss her. I miss her. Her perfume lingers like emissions with no aims test. I don't test her. I just fill her world with kisses. And she's my missus and I'm her mister. It's as clear as FM stereo with no resistors. I can't resist her. In fact, I love her. Love her like, hold her like, kiss her like, miss her like. A kid cherishing his new bike. Am I crazy? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Um, if you wanna purchase my book, I think Vertical has a few of them, and, or you can go on lulu.com slash robking76, thank you. All right. Thank you, Frost. And we just keep depositing into the poet tip jar. Um, so I'm going to head out for a little bit, and the lovely TM Goddle is going to take over until our slam ministrator, uh, Vertigo Xavier, comes back. But if you um, would like to be Skyped in, all my internet people, or if you're here and you want to perform, you can let TM know, or you can let Skylark know, our other team members, and let Vertigo know when he gets back. So anybody who would like to read or perform, any, any donation is accepted and wonderful and loved, and we would be grateful for it, and you can get up on the mic. All right, Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. Did I get it right? Yay! Oh, sorry. I got excited. Okay. Um, again, it is unmoderated, so watch your babies, watch your loved ones. There, there, there will be language and concepts that aren't necessarily meant for delicate ears. So, huh? <laughs> Especially with certain rebels in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Teresa. Woo!
I keep things PG-13, mister. So we are back. Uh, the Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive to support the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team. And this is not just about the Poetry Slam team. This is about representing Northeast Ohio at the National Poetry Competition, National Poetry Slam. This is the biggest poetry competition that takes place every year. There will be, we will be one of 72 teams competing um, from all over the country, all over the world. Um, it's very exciting, we're very excited to go, so help represent your city when uh, we head down to Charlotte next week. And I will be reading um, a few poems here. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, the Poets Haven, in conjunction with the Akron Peace Project, has put out uh, a little anthology called Vending Machine Poetry for Change. And uh, it's been a, uh, a benefit publication to support the, um, the food bank, the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. So I'm going to read a few pieces from that. This one is from uh, my friend Becky Hewitt, who, who is one of the two co-founders of the Akron Peace Project. Degraded, deprived, and caged, abused, murdered, rampaged, the earth's fate we will solder through this sentient slaughter unless we stand up and be the change. This is uh, called Singularity. It's by a uh, local poet, Jeffrey Landis. This is it. Nothing else you ever did matters. The place where all your words mean nothing. Doorway to forever. Phil Metris is a fantastic poet who teaches at uh, John Carroll, not too far from here. And this is his poem in the Vending, Mathene Vending Machine Anthology called For the Fifty Who Made Peace with Their Bodies. In the green beginning, in the morning mist, they emerge from their chrysalis of clothes, peel off purses and cells, slacks and gap sweats, turtlenecks and tanks, tommies and salvation, army platforms and clogs, abandoning bras and lingerie, labels and names, courtesies and shames, the emperor's rhetoric of defense, laying it down, their child stretched or still taught flesh, giddy in sudden proximity onto the cold earth, bodies fetal or supine, as if come hithering or dead, wriggle on the grass to form the shape of a word yet to come, almost embarrassing to name a word, thicker, heavier than the rolled rags of their bodies seen from a cockpit they touch to make the word they want to become. It's difficult to get the news from our bodies, yet people die each day for lack of what is found there. Here, the fifty hold, and still, to become a testament, a will, embody something outside themselves and themselves, the body, the dreaming, disarmed body. And this poem is called Surfacing by uh, another local poet, Mark Mannheimer. Desperate, or so she seemed, like one who is, has her head held down underwater too long. I did not say a word to her. Better to let people rise to the surface, I thought. Better to let people find their own way. So I enjoyed the transit ride, selfish as I am while people in this world were suffering. And as we passed through the valley with the sun on the train tracks, I turned to find her, the gulls flying low to the river, the river a miraculous blue, looking out the opposite window, a faint, contented, even joyful smile on her face. 
and I knew I could never affect a person any more than those who have suffered for me, who suffered, forgive me, needlessly. And uh, Diane Borsnick, uh, she also runs a, a, another small press here in Cleveland called Night Ballet Press. And this is a poem from her, and it's simply titled Vending Machine for Change. If only it were that simple. Open the wallet, smooth out a greenback, guide it to the slot and slide it in like a man into his lover and pops a change, political change, social change, spiritual change, ecological change, personal change, the denominations of the coins being understanding, responsibility, tolerance, the ability to respect and treat with justice. I'd pay for that. I'd shove those greenbacks in, piston-like, and catch change in both my hands. If only it were that simple, a vending machine for change in every lobby, on every street corner, open 24 hours. But I think the machine is broken. The light's not on, and the slot does not snatch what I'm offering, won't even mouth it when I try to tease it in. If we want change, we're going to have to look for it on the sidewalks, in the streets, on the dresser at home, in our pockets. We're going to have to pick up change and keep it close for all those times we need it, like now. A penny for your thoughts? Uh, this is titled August of Now by Cheryl Townsend. I have had red hair all of my life, a joke in my youth. I don't discard my friendships as easily as I did. The men, but these years, those that have passed through have taught me too much, and I stay quiet. I had regret in extra sizes and empty gas tanks. This is where I prefer it now, this reflection, sometimes smiling, mostly looking away for the damn mirror. So we are reading poetry for the Lake Effect Poetry Slam Day, Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. Um, if you are a performer of any kind, it doesn't have to be poetry, you can, you can be a singer, musician, dancer, dog trainer, um, acrobat, gymnastic, puppeteer, shadow puppets, vertigo, mime, Whatever it is that you do, if you like to be up on stage, I would take mime. Do you mime as? I don't mime. Oh. Okay. But whatever it is that you do, um, you are welcome for a donation. We'd love to have you up here to perform and uh, help, support, help support the SLAM team, help bring you and what you do to a new audience via not only here in Coffee Fix, but also to the internet and uh, our internet audience. What's that? And beyond. The internet and beyond. Um, I'm going to read a few more pieces from the vending machine for change. This is called Refugee by Tina Puckett. The last you saw me, I was a baby, begging at my mother's breast as her palm lay bare at your hip, approaching the touch of coins. I was woolen in my blanket, my mouth fuzzy, fuzzy with thirst as she starved her skin. She went so thin, people did not notice. She grew so invisible, she disappeared. Her eyes became small raccoons, her mouth a broken snake, her body bent and died in the street with me as her nucleus, still clinging, tasting her belly with my tongue, that human ash she'd become. And then another of you found me. She said my sucking mouth was, must release those dead balloons gone airless. I tried to mouth the word hungry in the same way. That woman had gone mute, wrapping her voice around my flesh. Her name was, please help her. You missed the hush. You missed the panic of it. You missed 
the one who grew thick in the ash of her embrace. is going to read. Um, so I'm going to yield the mic now to um, our, our friend Azriel Johnson, who is the, who's the, the organizer of the Writing Nights poetry readings and publisher of Writing Nights Press, who does a lot of wonderful work. He's been very supportive of the Lake Effect team as well. So I give you Azriel Johnson. Get something out. Hi. Hi. I'm Azriel and I'm a poemaholic. I've been intoxicated now for 15 years. Some years more word drunk than others, but always with a pencil close by and paper to spill words onto. A Senryu is the best way to start a day. This is Wake and Bake. I drink of life itself and my hangovers always leave me drained and satisfied. Hair of the dog, hair of the dog, just another drink of the words that make me think and feel and realize my real eyes are blurry without the clarity poetry can bring. Let me slam another slam piece. Let me sing a little sonnet. I want a three minute time limit. I want 14 lines to freedom. I'll admit I'm a cheap drunk. Even bad poetry can lead me to ecstatic musings of my own. If it's a night of performing or hosting shows, I can be the life of the party or the chick magnet when I'm on stage. If there are books to be peddled, I can give a contact buzz to anyone I meet. All they need is to hear or read the words our writers speak. All I want is to spread the love of poetry to everyone I meet, to everyone I see, to everyone who breathes. A gargle, a gozzle, I'll write sestinas and cantinas. I'll put an envoy on my elegy to ballads about odes. Here's a completely necessary caesura. Passion is contagious. You can spread it when it's real, and this poetry is to reveal what's brewing beneath the surface, providing me with substance. If I lost the gift of poetry, there would be nothing left of me. I'd be a hollow husk, a book with pages ripped out and left lying on the ground, blowing in the breeze. Oh, let me please, sir, please, oh, let me rhyme. Let me do it again just one more time. My name is Azriel, and I'm a poemaholic. I'm not seeking recovery. I'm reveling in my addiction, my obsession, my play, my passion, my poetry. Writing nights. Writing Nights, The Squire. We're going to put it on the Writing Nights site. That's writingnights.com for you internet people. Any, any copies that are sold this week until Sunday, I will donate half of the proceeds to the Lake Effect team. So buy it. This next one is gross. Um, uh, I, re I sometimes have these dreams that are really, really um, vivid and... I've been calling them ecclesiasticals, and I write them into little poetry things, so. A special friend's vagina is so deep it envelops my balls. We have sex slowly and passionately, but at last I am too weirded out by the feeling of balls sinking into her. I pull out and sit back, and then place a huge pillow all over her face. She doesn't struggle, when I, and when I remove the pillow, a, the girl is gone, and a baby chimp is in her place. <laughs> This one took me about two years to write. Not all like two years, just it took you two years for me to actually sit down and write it. Um, it's called Homelessness. Once you've gotten over the embarrassment of shitting outside, there is little else that bothers you. And the coldness of a mit Michigan winter is nothing to scoff at, especially when you have to shit and you don't have a toilet. 
Sometimes it's necessary to squat over a trash can and let fly into a plastic bag. And sometimes it's necessary to squat outside of a, an abandoned house. Toilet paper is always a necessity. Your storage unit is your roof, your temple, your ninja den. It's where you sleep when you have nowhere else. And it's your pride that keeps you here 10 months. It's your pride that loses your job and your cats. You do anything you can to subsist. You ride your bike two miles one way every day to the college in the morning. You achieve an associate's degree here about seven days before you got fired. You ride here because the computers are available all day, every day, except holidays and weekends after five. You go here to work for less money than you're worth because you have $50 a month storage unit where everything from your two-bedroom apartment now lives. Every little bit counts. You find a willing cancer survivor to fuck, and if you fuck her well enough, she'll offer you a roof a few days a week. In fact, anyone you fuck, you fuck them well because you never know if they might call you back. Your life is normal to everyone who isn't you. You don't tell your family about how you were living or where you were living. You tell only the people who live near you, your best friend, your cancer survivor, a few random online meets. You eat whenever you get the opportunity and you eat as much as you can because you don't know when your next meal will happen. <sighs> Collecting napkins ensures that you will always have the opportunity to blow your nose. Napkins, snotty or not, will ensure your coat will always have extra insulation. Napkins become security blankets, and even after you have found a new place, you find yourself collecting them in times of uncertainty. If a friend or acquaintance has pot to smoke, you take them up on the offer. Anything that helps you forget your plight is welcome. Sometimes you have a hard time saying no to the offer because it feels so good to forget. You almost fall in love with a girl who is still hung up on her ex. You smoke pot, you read her pieces of your novel. She doesn't stop you as you gradually, sensually work your hands over her deliciously full body. She does stop you before you enter her, but not with her hands. She stops you with your own heart. You don't get more than a mucus clog in the morning. This is probably because you're outside so much and the air outside is over 50% cleaner than inside air. But you put up with your best friend's schizophrenic roommate because you don't want to suffer a toothache alone. Even though this batshit insane midget is trying to tell you about Islam and how it's about war and destruction and hate, you don't want to have this conversation when not in pen, let alone while a tiny knife stabs you in the mouth. You don't hesitate to use anal oral rub on your tooth when overdosing and Tylenol and Aleve do not help. When you've hit rock bottom, you only have up to go. Then one night you feel like singing, but your neighbor with anger issues comes out of her house and says, Please stop, you're breaking my heart. You know your singing isn't that bad, and why her boyfriend left her. It's your pride that loses your source of income. Add to this your cancer survivor dumping you because you got too serious. You weren't in love with her, but she was part of the reason you stayed. Your best friend lost his apartment and moved in with his baby mama. Any friends you had at work stayed at work. They didn't stick with you, aside from the lesbian who you sometimes flirted with because you fo both felt alone. You call your family and they help you out of the storage unit with about 10% of your stuff. You lose your bed, your chairs, your table, and a bit of your freedom. You lose your self-confidence and a lot of your pride. You gain a warm house and a roof over your head, but lose all sense of home. Remember that other one I said was gross? This one's worse. I piss on my nephew's face as he cries in the middle of a vast white convenience store. When I finish, he runs away. I chase him with a towel and catch him and dry his face. I say, I'm sorry for this. I want you to remember, if anyone ever does this to you again, even me, kill them. <laughs> um... That must have been too gross for our audience. It's cool. All right. This next one is going to require some crowd participation. It's, ca it's called shopping carts. People! What? Put your shopping carts away. It means more than you might realize to other shoppers and to the lowly cart guy who has to clean up after messy, inconsiderate fuckers who just leave their carts out in the lot. 
Sure, dings and scratches on other people's vehicles aren't your concern, but heaven forbid a cart come in contact with your car. Oh no, then it's on like Donkey Kong and King Kong put together. How dare those idiots scratch my car? I'd sue if I know who did it. Right, but you never catch the person who did it because you did it yourself. Remember when it was raining and you couldn't be bothered to walk the 50 steps to the cart corral because you were wearing new shoes? Yes, it matters. It's the butterfly effect and the golden rule and the threefold law all wrapped up in the one. There are three steps to avoid getting scratches on your car. Step one, put your carts away. Step two, help other people in any way you can. Be tall when they're short. Be steady when they're shaken. Be strong when they're weak. Step three, when you hear a crash of carts coming towards you, Stand back, there's a cart man coming through. And remember, if you give of yourself to other people, you will be rewarded, whether it's by gods or the flying spaghetti monster or karma or the force or Newton's law of action and reaction. If you put a piece of yourself out there to help others, you will get it back. One fold, three fold, seven fold. Yes, it matters, because there is so much shit in the world, we need to start shoveling it into fertilizer. Let's turn the soil together. Black, white, yellow, brown, red, gay, straight, pan, male, female, trans, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, polytheistic, antidenominational, atheist, agnostic, pagan, Satanist, we all need to contribute. No one can do this alone. But there is one thing we can do ourselves. Put your carts away. Because yes, it matters. Okay, one more. All right, so back to this anthology thing. Last night we had a, the big winner of the grand tournament, Miss Skylark. Woo! And I actually contributed the last poem to this book, so I'm going to read it to you. And then I'm going to get out your hair. It's called Closed Book. Can you see it, Internet people? Internet? All right. This haiku college can no longer contain my Canzone heart. Am I really so eager to be released from the yoke of this academy of Watson poets? This is Jeopardy. The definition of a will. What is a dead giveaway? The lectures worked better than media, masturbation, or NyQuil and required no hands, eyes, or mouths. I don't want to like this. I mean, I don't want to write this. I mean, I don't want others to like this. I mean, I don't want my poetry to become monotone torture providing words no one gives a shit about. Does anyone really like this stuff or are they just trying to keep up with the Whitmans? The unsolidified evaporation enamors and enamels the unsteeled ubiquitous universe. Teeth grind through each sentence, enamels being power drilled and while I'm thankful to have been book learned until my brains have slid out my ears, are the things I've cherished most what I've sought all these years? My sonnets are dream songs from God. My rondeau will turn readers inside out. My free verse frees the soul. If a tree fell in a forest, it would still sound more exciting than listening to dismal poetry. The lessons learned. Thank you. I think I'll try the whole sitting down thing. I don't normally perform sitting down, but maybe it'll allow me to go a little longer. I'm going to read a bunch of pieces from my chat book. See that, internet people? I have a chat book. It's called, I Wish I Had Shit My Pants. That's the not safe for work cover. There is a safe for work cover, which has a different child, and it just says, I wish. So collect them all. They're six dollars a piece. And I shall begin with the very first piece here. I didn't know I was lost until I found you. The dark woods looked bright as day until you came along with a lantern. Your light was patterned in the shape of a triangle with a circle in the middle. The third time I bumped into you, I decided to go with you. I was not lost, I thought. I saw lots of people in the woods I knew were lost, stumbling, falling down, bleeding and crying. I would try to help them, keep them on my path with me. 
but I didn't see until the triangle circle light of your Al Anon lantern that I had been traveling the same looped path sometimes walking besides the path that you were on, but more often veering into an unlit thicket. When I saw you for the third time, you saw my lantern's flame had burned out, while I thought that it was shining brightly. You didn't scold me for carrying a useless lantern, instead inviting me to see by the light of yours. I would have to go with you, but hey, I like adventures. I could barely stand up on your path at first. Maybe the gravity's different here. There are 12 steps, you said, but let's go one step at a time. Your lantern seemed to get brighter. I started to realize how little I'd been seeing. Soon, I noticed all the trees around us, so you said I should be sure to visit every day. The trees reached out their branches so I could read the words embedded in the bark. Many, many words, most of them about people whose lanterns had gone out. I thought mine was still on, so only some of these sayings could be about me. Some of the trees offered me leaves with just a phrase on them. I could take these with me. One day at a time, mind your own business, think. Easy does it, just for today. The first tree branch I read and realized that it was for me said, I give up the illusion that I can control other people. The second, engraved in large letters on the tree trunk, was, I am worth more than what I can give to someone else. You pointed to my lantern. The wick, which had been cold and dry, now displayed a small flame. It wasn't casting much light, but I didn't see, and I didn't see the al triangle with a circle in it yet, but by golly, my lantern had a flame. You said my lantern would get stronger every day. You would share your light until I could see my way back to the trees every day myself. In time, mine too would shine brightly with all the familiar shapes of yours. And then we would visit the trees together to keep our lanterns burning. I didn't know I was lost until I found you, Alanon. Thank you. The next piece is called Prelude to Alanon. And this is something that I actually wrote before I started going to Al-Anon meetings, which for those who are not aware, Al-Anon is the support group for those who have loved ones who are addicts or alcoholics. Being needed makes me feel alive. I know I still breathe when someone can't get on without me. Indispensable. Always the friend to count on, the healthy one, their solid rock. The broken people come running, the scarred nuzzle to my breast. I know the blood still courses through my veins when I hear, please help me. I need to be needed, have to be had, raised to be unselfish, now I fear I am codependent. The singer lied when he sang, you're nobody until somebody loves you. But I didn't know it was also a lie that you're nobody until somebody needs you. I don't know if I think I can fix everyone and everything or if I just need to be around people who appear weak enough to make me feel strong. The event we're doing today is the Sunday Fun Day Fund Drive to hopefully send, woo, to hopefully send the Lake Effect Slam team to the National Poetry Slam in Charlotte, which is next week. We're leaving a week from tomorrow, assuming that we have money to get there. So contribute money. Um, you can donate online. You can donate to this tip jar here. Um, you can send us all your love and support if you are li li literally out of money. Um, but yeah, your, your cash is very, very much appreciated. Buy chat books, donate. You can come up here and you can perform for a donation. Anybody who wants to perform, just let one of us know. Let Teresa know. Let Vertigo know. Change is good. Pardon? Change is good, cash is better. 
Motherhood and womanhood are not synonymous, no matter how much anyone wants them to be. I am not a mother. I am a woman who is happy not being a mother. Do not confuse the two. Don't smile unknowingly. Don't tell me I will change my mind. Don't tell me my biological clock will start ticking. None of us know the future. Who is to say that if I had a kid or two, I might not hate parenthood and wish I could give them back? The best parents are those who want to be. Motherhood and womanhood are not synonymous. I am a woman. That is enough. <clears throat> Hiding at a poetry slam. I hid. I put my head between my knees and I wished to the gods I could disappear, but not for all the usual reasons. This was too good to be true. An attractive man extolling how wonderful my body is and still hanging expectantly in the air the words, stretch marks are beautiful. And my favorite sound is a voluptuous woman in bare feet upon a wood floor. My hands covered my face in embarrassment, though I lapped up every word. It seems that all the body-positive self-talk I have done in the mirror over and over and over again in the mirror at home did not prepare me for the image of myself I saw in the mirror of this poet on stage. I tell myself my curves are sexy, but I don't know if that message has seeped through my psoriasis plaque skin and been absorbed into my core. Maybe if it had, I would not have hidden. Too many stories I could tell of finally attracting a man with my personality, only to watch him become yet another hanger-on to my thin, cute little sister. Don't get me wrong, if he's shallow, I want him gone. Just not like that. Did I want the tables to be turned? Of course I did, but I wasn't expecting such attention from a stranger at a poetry slam, especially not while the man I wanted to be dating was sitting right next to me. Thank you. He might? Okay, well, that would be a first time in a while that he actually followed through on something. <laughs> and then this is about the, the man who I had been sitting next to who I wanted to be dating at that time after things didn't go well. You're a user and a pusher and a sellout. I see right through you. You've got nowhere to hide. You take good things and twist them all around until the people riding on your coattails get buried under a mountain of bullshit. You're a user and a pusher and a sellout. I can't tell if you ever disbelieved the lines you, co you so carefully craft to pull in your next big catch. But my years spent cold calling have not been wasted. I see your sales pitch and I raise you three. You're a user and a pusher and a sellout. I used the nice girl next door hook to pedal the cock and bull malarkey and I didn't even want to. Your approach is much more slick, polished salesman and you like that world. I knew it from the moment you opened your mouth to try to convince me that the pig in a poke was a golden opportunity not to be passed up by one as savvy as I. You're a user and a pusher and a sellout. All your web spinning about unswerving moral centers and unflappable ethical compasses was just butter on the rails of the sled you tried to put me on. That's a ride into the pit of hell. We have nothing of value in common. Take your tea with honey, your euchre and settlers and your oldest child stories. You're a user and a pusher and a sellout. I've gotten over better men. We have another performer. Sweet! What's this performer's name? Jim? Welcome to the mic, Jim. Thank you. I don't have to adjust this to anything. I've done this at, I guess, Poets Haven one or two times, but this time I have a captive audience with me that I have to pay for. Uh, what I do is a little different than slam poetry. I uh, and I have a colleague uh, whose name is Elena, and we do original translations of 19th and 20th century Russian poetry and opera. I'm not going to do any singing, but I have a few select uh, poems, translations that we're hoping to eventually publish. So if I may just read a few. I did tell Jacob, who insisted I show up, 
that uh, I have about five hours of material. I think that would really clear the place out. Of course, if I'm paying a dollar a minute, uh, that would pay for your quota, I suppose. All right. The first one is, um, is entitled To KB. A lot of the Russian poets use just initials. This is a love poem by Fyodor Juchev. I met you with my heart enthralled and our whole past again revived. That golden time in me recalled, my tender love to you survived. As in the late autumn that does appear, some days will happen, hours come, when suddenly spring will be here, to which we may sometimes succumb. Like a weight upon my spirit pressing to those years of emotion captured, with long forgotten joy expressing, I look upon your face enraptured. Like after a century's separation, as if in a dream upon you I gaze, sounds have greater amplification. In me, dead silence no longer stays. There is not only recollection, there life began to speak again. I see you in the same attraction. My soul is filled with love as then. Now, jumping, uh, switching gears, this is poetry. Thank you. This is by perhaps the greatest Russian female poet. Uh, her name was Anna Akhnat Akhnatova, um, which is a tongue twister. She had a tough life. She did have some lovers and was uh, quite uh, prolific in her poetry. She wrote this called Requiem. She uh, was married a couple times. One husband was, the first one was executed. The second one wound up in prison, or her son wound up in prison. Uh, she was pretty much exiled, uh, fell out of favor with the Soviet uh, regime. But she was a great poetess and lady. And she wrote this, this is one of her favorite, famous poems, and this is the English, our original English translation, called Requiem. And if it happens someday in this land, that a monument to me, be, to me will be planned. For celebration, I give permission, but only on this one condition. Not near the sea where I was born, since from this tie I have been torn. Not at a cherished stump in the garden royal, where restless phantoms seeking me do toil. But here where I stood for 30 hours more, where entrance denied past the bolted door. Therefore, until death without my muses, I will not forget black rushing maruses, nor how the dreaded door banging increased, or an old woman howled like a wounded beast, and from immobile bronze eyelids flow tears streaming down like melting snow. In the distance, let a prison dove chirp gaily, and quietly ships navigate the Neva daily. My son is in prison, my husband in a grave. Please pray on my behalf, for I must be brave. Anna Akhmatova. All right, uh, maybe one or two more. Cranes, or a half a dozen, whatever. I'm paying for it. All right, Cranes is a very famous Russian song. It came out after World War II. Uh, it was written by Razul Gamzatov, who was quite a drinker and an interesting guy in his own right. Uh, but this is the translation. It's about soldiers who come back as birds, as cranes. And it says, it seems to me at times that many soldiers did not return home from bloody burning plains, were not entombed nor getting older, but did convert themselves into white cranes. And now they, from that time very distant, still fly and send us their bitter cry. Therefore, of sadness and sorrow persistent, we all stand rigid looking up at the sky. In early evening of twilight this day, I can see how in dense fog cranes fly. In fixed formation, always they will stay, like marching men before on earth did try. They fly as always in designated lanes, and some familiar names they screech. Would not the loud voices of the cranes for me seem similar to Avar's speech? To the high heavens they fly in place, my former friends and relations observed, 
and their form formation is only a small space, this place is possibly for me reserved. The day will come, and with a flock of cranes, together I will fly in the same bluish mist, under high heaven like a bird calling the names of all whom on the earth that I have missed. Okay. And then finally, <laughs> tough choices, well, for me tough choices. Uh, we, we do have in our proposed anthology one living Russian poet named Naum Korjavan. He was a dissenter. He was incarcerated. He was in the Gulag. He survived and now resides in Boston, ailing in his mid-80s. But he wrote a beautiful poem about women in Russia who haven't changed in 100 years, the, the way they're treated, in spite of what we see. So it's called The Century Has Passed By, by Naum Korjavan. A century has run its course. Still, woman's lot is in a rut. She can stop a galloping horse and enter a burning hut. She would like an expensive dress and have life with a different turn. But horses still run and onward press, and houses continue to burn. Tough life. Thank you. We are raising money for the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team to go to the National Poetry Slam next week. So if there's anybody else who would like to perform for a donation, that's what we have this lovely jar for here. And Vertigo is looking at me like, I need to say something different. Okay, cool. Um, is there anyone else who wants to stop me from performing anything? Who wants to get up here and replace me? Okay, then I will continue. A steel band constricts around the sun, choking out the warmth. It expands, subduing more of the rays that once danced with me. As the natural nourishing light disappears, the steel starts to glow. The glow is harsh, fluorescent. The light it produces is tense and sadistic. First it claimed the man I fancied, and now my aunt is slipping away too. Both warm, engaging people since relegated to cold, stifling scripts. A simple requ request for information from one sparked a sales recruitment litany, while the other bristled in tidy overreaction to my mother's plea. A plea not to use my mother's friends for my aunt's business purposes. When do you get the big payout? When do the promised riches, the elusive miracle, materialize in exchange for sacrificing your personal relationships? Red pill, blue pill, wake up, wake up! I liked you so much better, Auntie, when we made peach crisp together in your kitchen, singing goofy children's songs about green apples and bananas, grown opals and bananas. You were the fat, jolly lesbian who all the kids adored because you were so comforting and upbeat. When we trotted out all the family skeletons tied up neatly with bows in Grandpa's closet, you were human then. No one would talk about it except you. I respected you as much as I loved you. Now you bear more resemblance to a spam bot and a corporate drone. I miss your, I love you too, XOXO at the end of every email, reminding me your arms are long enough to hug me even from Florida. Now you want me to buy into the same multi-level marketing hokum that has you impaled on promises of riches while sitting at your computer. If I could pick one relative for the pyramid slave masters to beguile, it would not be you. The headhunters must look for well-liked people. They know we are loath to expunge a favorite person from our midst when their presence brought so much merriment and light. We want to trust them because we always have, but the cold, sanitized, multi-level bullshit doesn't sound more plausible in your mouth. 
It just makes me loathe ever more the Cretans who did this to you, whose soldered and galvanized hearts form a steely band around the sun. Thank you. This one is called self-diagnosis, and it's short. Stomach pain, no reason why that I can explain. Back cramping, head pounding, either this is the flu, menstruation, or I'm in love. In that particular case, I actually had the flu. <laughs> this is called paranoid searching. I went by your house, but you weren't there. The library and your favorite coffee house, but you weren't there. I went home hoping you would drop by, but you weren't there. Dread mixed with consternation flavored my mug of tea. Tea and then teardrops. Sobbing in the bathroom both from missing you and not being sure if the person I missed even existed. Wishing that you were not part of the trouble so you could be here to comfort me in it. The not knowing rubbed my nose raw with every tissue. This is one that I wrote for my friend Maya um, for her birthday. It's called A Celebration of Hugging. One of the few downsides of living alone is not getting many hugs. So it's kind of fabulous in a weird way that my computer is broken. It gives me an excuse to drop in on people like Maya, Tatiana, Aya, and now Andrew. Before I hit the keyboard, I need my first round of hugs. Some people perk up with coffee, but I'll take hugs over caffeine any day. All that warm nearness, heads tucked under chins, noses nuzzled into hair, boobs squishing into armpits and arms everywhere. Oh yeah, this is a great pick-me-up. This next piece is called Living and Dying in Her Car. It's dedicated to Monique Crockett, who last May of 2011 was found dead in the trunk of her car, and she was 25. Her boyfriend was later convicted of her murder, um, so I was inspired to write this piece. They said she was living out of her car as though no permanent address makes her less of a person, not contributing. We don't know what she was into. She worked for a nursing home at least for a while. Perhaps she lost her job, you know, budget cuts or downsizing, and then had no way to pay for her home or take care of her three kids. Some say she had to have been a drug addict or a drunk, but we don't know. Don't assume the worst because of where she lived or the color of her skin or because she may have had bad taste in a boyfriend. Let the detectives go down every negative alley. You and I must stand with the mourners. I had bad taste in a roommate last year. It lasted about a month and this was about a week before she threw me out. Your dishes are in the sink. They have been there for days. Don't pretend you didn't know. Don't blame your lack of consideration on your boyfriend. Your dishes are in the sink. The cigarette butts slowly circling inside the half-filled cups. The moldy silverware scratching out a design on the sink walls. Your dishes are in the sink. You tell me you will get to them. I've heard that before. I have not lived here three weeks, but I've been on to you for two and a half. Your dishes are in the sink. Dried coffee stains decorate the counter. Sugar and creamer crunch underfoot. Splatters adorn the microwave inside and out. If you ever used the oven, I'm sure you'd make a mess of that too. Your dishes are in the kitchen sink. Your makeup and cigarette ashes cake the bathroom counter. Your hair lines the bathtub, and I'm surprised. The toilet looks fairly clean. You marvel at how clean the kitchen looks after I cook. You say you can't clean up after yourself, but you never leave the house. You're working on your novel. Your dishes are still in the sink. I should hide the coffee filters. Thank you. 
This is the Sunday Fun Day Fund Drive for the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team. We are trying to get to the National Poetry Slam next week, and we need your help to do it. So if anybody is interested in performing up here for a donation, we have our lovely donation box right here. If you are watching online, you are able to donate online too, I'm sure. Vertigo has made all things possible. So um, are there any other people as of this moment who would like to perform? I know you're a performer, sir. I've seen you before. <laughs> I swear I've seen you before. No, no. Would you like to perform? It doesn't have to be poetry. It, you, you could be singing, dancing, miming, you know, pantomime, shadow puppets. Jumping jacks, that would work too. For a donation, you can do just about whatever you want. <laughs> All right, then I will keep going. Just let um, me or Vertigo or any of us really know that you want to perform and we will make sure that you get up here ASAP. This is called Two Miles and No Bathrooms. Such a welcoming city is Orlando, Florida for the homeless. It's the happiest place on earth for the hungry. It's so hospitable that the local authorities will gladly arrest those who feed the hungry living downtown. City officials cracked down and said not to feed 25 or more people more than twice a year within two miles of City Hall. Apparently, in the happiest place on earth, you can live on love and light for six months at a time. You don't need to go three times a week to Food Not Bombs meals and figure out what to eat the other four days. City officials tried to move the meals to a parking lot, two miles from where the homeless live. A hot, mostly unshaded slab of tarmac, bordered by a power substation and a highway overpass, with not a bathroom in sight. Mickey Mouse would be proud, Donald Duck thrilled. Family-friendly cartoons are all about pretending that if you stop feeding homeless people, refuse to let them use a toilet, and chase them out of downtown, then no one will be homeless. If it didn't happen near the not-in-my-backyard people, then it didn't happen at all. Orlando, you are the king of fairy tales, champion of make-believe, and dreamer of impossible dreams. Give up the fantasy that you can end homelessness by arresting people. Thank you. I need a drink. I'll be right back. He wrapped his fingers around my neck, screaming. He dug his grubby nails into my sweaty skin, pleading not to let him go. The desperate outburst from a year and a half old child in my arms erupted because he glimpsed his mother. His mother, su madre, who we believed to be abusing him or looking the other way while someone else did. The belt mark, oh the belt mark, raised welts on the boy's back and the cruel outline of a large metal buckle. Luis arrived at the, at the daycare as a new admission that morning, and on the first diaper change, my coworker discovered the bruising. He slept on my lap most of the day. He should have at least that much time to be safe. Tranquilo. I wanted to hold him forever, keep him away from every terror. In Bolivia, Children's Services does very little. They place abandoned children in orfanatos and not much else. The daycare director said she would meet with the mother when she came to pick up Luis. One, two, three, four o'clock. The hours never marched forward so fast before. Beep! Le toca Luis! And the intercom summons I dreaded all day. I carefully gathered Luis's few threadbare belongings into his stained backpack. Bailamos, urged the Santa Cruz sunbeams. Let's dance and we will soothe his pain. I contemplated taking a circuitous route through the playground in the implausible hope that a minute more away from his mother would amount to something. 
but I just walked slowly. When Luis saw his mother, he clung to my neck and began to wail. I froze, trying not to run away and take him with me. I was prepared for me to despise this woman upon meeting her, but mi Dios, what daily terrors has she been serving him? All the other kids run happily to their parents. I bent down to stand Luis on the floor. He kicked his legs back and forth, tightening his grip and crying, no, no, no. I turned to the director, Lucy, and she reached out to take him. I pried his fingers loose from my neck, easing him into her arms, and then the hardest moment of all, turning my back and walking out of that room. I tried to tell myself that Lucy would handle everything, but I knew she couldn't do much. Her hands were bound by parent favoring laws and public officials who minded nothing but bribes. If ever there was a country whose children needed los políticos on their side, it was Bolivia. My wooden feet could barely carry me to the closest bathroom. Despite, despite my quivering lower lip and welling eyes, I felt hollow, ineffective. After my emotional release, I tamped my heart back down and returned to the toddler room, where 15 more Boliviano children waited for their parents. I appreciated those parents more now, for despite their flaws, they cared for their children. I prayed Luisa's mother would learn from them. Muy, muy rápido. Gracias. This is the Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. If anyone wants to get up here and perform, we are accepting donations to send the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team to nationals in a little over a week, and we desperately need money in order to get there. So if you have a hula hoop act or a poem that you want to read, a song you'd like to sing, a song you'd like to lip sync, you know, it's all cool. Just donate and get up here and do it. So, unless there's another performer, I shall continue. Hi, my name is Skylark, but that's not what my mama said. My mama said she wasn't planning to have a baby with my daddy yet, not until he was done with his PhD. My mama said she'd be happy with a daughter or a son. She wanted a healthy baby. My mama said, no drugs for me, a natural childbirth, my mama said. When the doctor handed the baby to my mama, she said, it's a boy. My mama said the baby's name was Joseph Michael because my mama said the baby was male. My mama said she saw a penis. My mama and my daddy called their friends and all their family. We have a son, they said. My mama's daddy went into work. He told his coworkers he had a grandson. The church secretary typed the announcement, and the bulletin went to the printer. My daddy saw the baby blanket had come undone. He saw what my mama had not. My daddy said, honey, we don't have a male child. We have a female child. My mama didn't know what to say. She found the words to call everyone back, explain over and over again her mistake. Some people thought she was saying she'd had twins. My mama said my name was Sarah Michelle. Friends nicknamed me Sarah Joe. My mama said Sarah will do fine. And mama, you were closer to right. I used that name for the next 16 years. See, my mama gave me the most common female name for babies in the early 80s. Homeschoolers named their first daughter Sarah and their second daughter Rachel. That's how it was done and that's how my mama did it. My mama said, it's such a nice name, and Michelle comes from the Beatles song. It was playing in the restaurant the evening my parents were picking baby names. When I started using, when I started using Skylark as my name, I didn't tell my mama. She figured it out over time when my college friends called asking for Skylark, not Sarah. My name is Skylark, and my mama is learning not to say anything. Thank you. 
This is a letter to myself in October 2007. Dear Skylark, you've scared yourself lately. You've scared yourself more than anyone ever scared you in a lifetime of fear-based religion. It's the driving. I know you have intolerable thoughts of just veering off that bridge or into that tree. You don't want to do it, but surviving one more day of this entirely mundane, insignificant existence with only a few pinpricks of reason to keep going, you're not sure you can do it. I know the bile rises in your throat when you think about getting behind the wheel, hands shaking, praying to any listening deity that this will not be that day. The day that disappoints everyone you cannot live for anymore. The uncontrollable images of crashing, careening, of disintegrating into nothing continue. So you stay up most of every night watching any DVD that will fill your mind with something besides this emptiness. The loneliness that crept up on you snuck into your apartment and refused to leave. It happened while you were out, while you were reporting on someone else's life. At the newspaper, you all worked hard to get out of the way of the story. If you were doing it right, it was as though you didn't exist. You will find yourself clutching the phone tonight, sobbing into the ear of a friend a few miles away, because you realized, after a day making pine wreaths at a Christmas tree farm for a lighthearted news story, that even the fun parts of the job are not enough to stave off what you know will happen. What will happen if you don't change everything? Your friend will be shocked. He will think your tears are something you will just move on through by daybreak and you'll be fine. But he doesn't know the depth of your desperation that scurried in on rodent feet at night. So you'll turn in your two weeks notice tomorrow, make plans to leave next month for another country, a South American land you hope will distract your mind with something more important than you. This running away will work for a while. The hideous carousel of emotions that point to self-destruction while driving will not stop until you face them. Until you fling yourself off the merry-go-round, vomit in the dirt from the increasing dizziness, and let someone else help you up. Thank you. Does Vertigo have something to say? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, how about we do one more piece? Because that's the last piece in the chat book. Some people are born poets. Others of us have to work really hard to force the turn up blood ink from the pen onto taunting empty pages. I've met people I swear scooted backwards out of the birth canal just so they could pulsate a bit longer with their mother's heartbeats echoing through a contracting chasm of amniotic fluidity. They took the direct path to indirect imagery. But my voyage away from sterile, logical anonymity took longer. Know yourself first, and through your poetry, everyone shall know you. These poets, these born poets, spoke their first words in the form of a haiku. As they progressed, their parents declared to friends, your kid speaks in full sentences, <laughs> underachiever, mine speaks in sonnets. My earliest writings evoked such lifelike phrases as, we went to church today, then I weeded the garden. But when the summer moon finally leaned in my bedroom window and trailed her beams across the end of my bed, she left behind a slow-acting ancient dust, the speck I carried with me unconsciously, like belly button lint and toe jam, a fleck of yeast so small I didn't know it could rise until it went bursting over the edges of the baking dish, sizzling on the bottom of the oven of friendship and roasted with repeated invitations. Every batch of attempted poetry a tiny bit better than the last. Some smoked into oblivion, others undercooked and raw. Cooking a loaf of poetry requires numerous ingredients, and one day, I might just get the proportions right. And now welcome to the microphone, Vertigo!
That's a little better. As mentioned a few times before, we have books here for sale. Um, with one exception, all the books back there, the entire price will go to getting the SLAM team to competition next week. Um, and the, the one book that, that's an exception to that, I have to, yeah, h half the money goes to the team, the other half goes to the uh, publisher. Um, that includes the books I've published. Um, I'm the, 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 the few books I put up there, the whole price will go to the team. Um, and of course we have the Lake Effect team anthology available. Um, if you're watching at home, lakeeffectpoetry.com, you can pick it up with a $6 donation via PayPal, uh, free shipping as well. I'm going to read a couple pieces from, hmm? <laughs> going to read a, two pieces from Ben Bartman. He's a, he was a local poet. He recently moved to Michigan. A new, uh, new job took him up there. <clears throat> this is from, this is from his book Interfaces, which Poets Haven published. That's my press, Poets Haven published. And this one is available at onpoetshaven.com. The Poet Army Two. Our poet army is versed in the art of subversion. We strum new chords that evoke new emotions by revealing ourselves. Armed only with words and subterfuge, we instill new visions that wrinkle your prejudices and expose your temper to mutiny. Squads of words join into verses which become the fuse that ignites the bomb, which shatters ideas only to reform with new revelations and revolutions. Our poems speak with the stealth of the ninja, the courage of the spy, the power of the atom, the vision of the general, and the righteousness of the gods. And from the same book, Storm Clouds. I should. The day is clear, not a protest on the horizon. The sky is tinted Pacific blue. There are no clouds of trouble. But wait, a wisp of freedom in the cirrus on the horizon. No, it is blown away. Over there, a large cumulus cloud bearing down over the mountains, littered with hunger and deprivation. The cloud empties its anger on the mountains and disappears. But the, morning remain, but, but the mountains remain cleansed of their anger. Look that way, and that huge thunderhead raining down fury and fear on the gods below, blowing the gods away, cleansing the land of false immortality with a flood. The clouds never come our way. We stay dry and never look up, because our gods are right, and they control the clouds anyway. We never feel the rain of frustration and hurt, or the winds of fear. Our gods somatize our, wor our world to prevent the storms of others from changing us. Something's not right. Storms should sweep our land, too. Don't we feel and taste anger? The water, the water laden the water-laddened hot air rises here just like there. The same rain and wind blows here and there. Are we not soaked and destroyed as our brothers over there? Their storms are no different. Look up. The clouds are forming above us. Yes, I see them. Can't you? Just look up. Go ahead. Look up! The gods are afraid of the storms. Keep looking up. The gods don't control the storms anymore. The gods fear the rain and the winds of change. Don't look up. Don't look up. Or the clouds will rain their anger on you. That's Ben Bartman. And a piece from Christina Brooks, whose book, A Thousand Voices, is free to anyone who buys a book here tonight, today. You can get a copy of this for free. Or if you go to Poets Haven uh, with any, buy two or more items from the store on, on the website, and you can get a copy of this for free there. Buy books, buy books. That's how we, uh, the, 
Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, I got laid off this week, so this is my selling books is my only source of income, and I've fun, fun. At least until I get something else lined up. Okay, to be a cat. The only indication of a struggle is the soft pile of pin feathers littering the ground. But being able to predict the outcome doesn't make it easier because it's not about hunger. It's about appetite, predator and prey. It's about the hunt. In the end, it's about dying, young starling, tail feathers torn out, lying stunned in the grass, unable to fly, found, shaking and shuddering, waiting for the end. You, the game over, perfectly indifferent as I cradle him, giving him one last comfort. And all you can do is meow, rub my legs, wanting to be fed. And I think this is what it means to be a cat. Lightning strike. I lift my hand, brush the gray away. It stains the morning, deep and unrelenting, an emotional canvas drained of life, smeared with grief, emotional ash pressed up beneath my fingertips. Too distracted to pray, storm clouds scud overhead, looming messengers, they shape my thoughts like malabid, strung and knotted, concocted by, by a string, karma unbroken. The morning's meditation, colorless but not void, seething with regrets. Obstacles seem to mount, no escape from the brewing storm. Hard to sit here, quietly and wait for lightning to finally strike. This book also has cover art by Stephen B. Smith. I'm a publisher, I'm a promoter, I'm an organizer. I don't write many of my own pieces. This might explain why. These were written in 1995. I repeat, 1995. I was a sophomore in high school when these were written. I filled a dozen or so notebooks with this kind of drivel. Those notebooks have all been burned. I tried throwing them away in 2000, maybe 2001, but my mother found them and saved them. I found them some years later and then made sure they saw the warmest portions of the backyard fire pit. Out of those horrid journals, only seven poems remain. Out of those seven poems, only two can be described as better than Vogon poetry. Anybody not know what a Vogon is? Okay, poetry, well written, can be a spiritually uplifting experience. Badly written, it can be an experience of buttock clenching horror. The third worst poetry in the universe is written by Vogons and is frequently used as a form of torture. The absolute worst poetry was written by Paul and Nancy Millstone Jennings. It involved decaying swans. Luckily, it was destroyed during the demolition of planet Earth. From Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So out of those, out of those seven poems, only two can be described as better than Vogon poetry. The two poems you're about to hear aren't those poems. Visions of insanity running through my head make me wish sometimes that I had stayed dead. The life that I came back for is no longer mine to live. I escaped my personal, or the feelings that I had are no longer mine to give. I escaped my personal hell to enter one much worse, reborn to immortality with a life now dispersed. My life was gone in the early dawn. My loves were lies, my hopes cries. Tears blurring my vision. I cry for the life I've lost. I shall live forever, but at what cost? Needless to say, me circa 1995 spent way too much time listening to Meatloaf albums, watching Highlander, and reading Anne Rice novels.
something a little more recent, and I'm sure everybody that knows me has heard me read this like 50 times by now, but I have rules about dating, simple rules. They don't need too much explanation. Rule one, no smokers. Ashtray mouth is gross and I'm allergic to tobacco anyway. Rule two, no more than six years younger, no more than 10 years older. This one's been adjusted as I've gotten older. And this is the one that's currently plaguing me right now, but. <laughs> Rule three, no more chicks named Angie. Long story. Rule four, do not try to convert a lesbian. Any attempt to do so will be met with abject failure. There's more, but those are the ones you need to know. With those in mind, I bring you a single man's lament at a poetry reading. A fiery redhead, shaped so fine, sporting a punk rock tee and a black denim jacket, confident, self-assured, attractive as all get out, cleavage as far as the eye can see. Did I mention she was fine? Her turn at the mic, a good writer, a great performer. Could she be any more perfect? And this next piece is dedicated to my girlfriend. <sighs> Damn. Roll it up and go home. Electric blue hair and biker tattoos. Hot as hell. Notebook in hand, ready to slam. Watch as she walks by, her voluptuous ass squeezed into black leather. Oh, the things I want to do. She steps outside to get some air, to use a phone. No, no. The flick of a bick as she lights a nail. Damn. Roll it up and go home. A blonde bombshell, wild, crazy, more animated than a cartoon character. A buxom burnet, strong, athletic. Maybe she plays softball. I've got a bat she can swing. As so they chat at the bar, I cannot decide which gal I want to approach. Anybody got a coin I can borrow? Wait, wait, no, no, ladies, please. Don't practice mouth to mouth in public. Ah, hell, I don't think I can roll it up, but it is going home. Somebody else will have to step up here after this one. With apologies to Bill. To shave or not to shave, tis a hard decision. Whether a gruff, hirsute demeanor lends itself to a professional appearance, or to take razor to one's features and face the world baby smooth. To wear beard no more, and by shaving we find a childlike image, lacking the signs of ageist tarnishment, a goal often wished by the masses. Or to keep the beard, to show maturity, mature but unbusinesslike. There's the gag, for not in professional immaturity nor in mature blue colonists. In neither of these physical presentations does business take seriously. No respect, no matter your vocal or written approach. Why, without the white collar scorns of time, does the financial elite's arrogance, close mindedness make them unwilling to consider, to listen to, the proposal of ideas and opportunities from The proposal of ideas and opportunities from outside their own social circle, despite their possible benefit. Or does this worry, this concern for others' impressions, make me guilty of the same ignorance, the same elitism and snobbery, the same ass-mightedness that which I accuse others of? Thus, my debate is rendered inert. And no longer should it matter whether my appearance I do alter as my decision has no bearing upon my professional standing or financial actions. So, a Muppet or a Lumberjack? Alas, an indecision, my choice remains yet unmade. Those watching at home, if you would like to read during this show and can't make the drive to Cleveland, we have Skype and Google Plus connectivity. Um, shoot me a message. My phone number is in that blue thing scrolling across the top of the screen. Uh, give me a f phone call or a text message and we can get you, get you hooked up. Who's next? Who's next? 
Hey, m ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Brightman. As Vertigo said, my name is Steve Brightman. I'm going to be reading some of my poems. Um, even if you don't want to read tonight, be sure to donate. It's Sunday, fun day, fun drive. We're trying to get the slam team to Charlotte, North Carolina in eight, this many days, eight days. <laughs> we are halfway. Why are we really? Nice. Good job, everybody. Um, this poem is titled, If You Let It. People thick streets are not awash with blood, nor need they be. Impatient young feet are not drums of war, nor need they be. The rumble in the distance that you hear, the shift in vibration that makes you want to raise your hand heavenward to indicate that you heard it through the cacophony, that is for you. It will not hit you like a wall of sound, but it will take the breath from you just the same. It will lay its healing hands on you just the same. It will overwhelm you one lovely note at a time. Thank you. Uh, this poem is titled A Bouquet of Voices. It's from The Squire, just uh, released last night. Uh, according to Az, uh, half of every, uh, of every uh, sale uh, of The Squire over the next eight days will go towards supporting the slam team, so by all means. Uh, bouquet of Voices. There was no light like they said there would be, only a bouquet of voices. Some I'd recognized and others I didn't. Those were more stern, less pleading. Anesthesia, a fog in my lungs, was supposed to dissipate, but did not. You have to sit up, they said. You have to breathe, they said. I could hear the pleading in between nurses' orders, could hear prayers set upwardly mobile. Still, there was no light, only fog. Faces were not clear to me yet. All of the voices became one. Pleas were orders, orders were pleas. I could hear the clock hammering, all of them silent, could hear the rush of air into the blood pressure cuff. I remember turning my head to the side while they checked my blood pressure, remember my arm hanging there, but not remembering the word for arm. Thank you. On the salty flat, a jaw clenches at abstraction like she always does, like she always does, excuse me, jaw cannot chew truth. Jaw pulverizes complex mathematics, grinds until there is nothing left but one, and one, and one. Jaw cannot chew heaven. Jaw purses her angry lips, spits at the satellites, dislocates herself from herself, and waits to catch the angels on the salty flat of her outstretched tongue. Jaw cannot chew love. Right angles and flat surfaces. The man who hung the drywall told me the bottom floor of heaven was concave and slightly uneven. He said that seeing is believing and that heaven was just on the other side from where my wall meets the ceiling. He told me that he saw it with his own two eyes and that this really was the easiest job he had ever finished. Every other job, he said, was nothing but right angles and flat surfaces. He said he could have done this one with his eyes closed. He spread the mud nice and thick along the taped in joints and feathered it in once it dried. All he had to do, he said, was keep that warm and golden light from shining through. Uh, this poem is titled, like, like Michelangelo said, it's a title poem from a chapbook that has been submitted to Poets Haven and uh, should see the light of day somewhere in 2013, June. in June of 2013. So we're looking at 11 months, like Michelangelo said. It was June, funnily enough, like Michelangelo said, it was June or maybe July that year when I realized my shadow didn't fit me anymore. Its sudden shock swamped the margin and drained off the page into the brittle lives of the nuns, the nobodies, and the neurotics. I was free to deliberately strip the branches of the eucalyptus until the skin under my fingernails cracked and I could no longer tell where the menthol ended and where the blood began. I was removing everything that didn't look like faith. And uh, I've been writing a poem every day for quite a bit now. It's uh, become part of my daily routine. And I'm not quite sure why, but um, 
religion, not overt religion, but religious allusions have entered uh, my poems. And uh, this poem is written about John the Baptist. The knuckle is proof. They say that amongst the unprovable relics, they found his knuckle, that the knuckle is proof. Collagen was extracted, genetic code carbon dated. There have been press releases and hopeful equivocations bleeding that this knuckle could be from the hand that baptized Christ, that this could be but one of the knuckles folded under each other while Salome swung her raunchy hips. A tumble of knots. Working upstream into the tiers of Lorca, there were no hours spent practicing in the natatorium, no orange slices after meats, no medals around necks. My shoulders should not be a tumble of knots already. I should not be gasping for air and sucking in chlorine. I should not be forgetting that the kick helps to propel. Then begin the whispers. Open your eyes, he says. I squint through the surface to see the alliance of stars, and it becomes clear that I, too, would add to our harmony. Thank you. Their moral bones. The words, they line up like soldiers or saints waiting for their turn. They enlisted with their right hands raised toward God and know that they serve a higher purpose. They can feel it in their moral bones. They live to die, just like all of us, but a little more eager. The words, they tense up once the marching orders are sent from the comfort of an underground bunker. They wait to stain the page. They have a legacy to fulfill. They have a story to tell. The value of my veins. My darling venom, I knew you before I knew you. I felt you turning your feckless somersaults, dismounting from my double helix before I could even stand. My darling venom, saying that you course through my veins, does a disservice to you and overstates the value of my veins. You helped me run from Ohio as fast as I could, as soon as I could, as many times as I could. My darling venom, you set the compass point to paper in the flicker fire shadows and circumscribed the dangerous radius between cartilage and cartography. You knew my ligaments would fray under the ugly weight of daylight. You knew that maps would never hold me. Thank you. Trying not to drink into the microphone. Sorry. This poem's titled Before Borders. She Wolf curses the unlit perimeter, remembers land before borders, dreams of the hunt. She Wolf swears that this winter will be the last winter she is bound. She Wolf growls across shadowed fur in muffled agony, remembers life before borders. She Wolf remembers the taste of blood. She Wolf remembers. Uh, this poem was uh, the first poem that got me any um, sort of recognition or uh, identification in, as a poet, um, with the quotation marks, of course. It was uh, published in the Ohio Bicentennial Anthology back in uh, 2003. And uh, it's a poem that uh, if you haven't lived in, out in the sticks, you wouldn't understand, but it's titled The Benefits of Living in Geauga County. I fell asleep before the 11 o'clock news and stayed on the couch until the dog woke me up at 2.30 a.m. I took the eight groggy steps to the sliding glass door and realized that I had to go too. If I were living in Lyndhurst or Columbus or Massillon, it would have never entered my mind, but I don't live in Lyndhurst or Columbus or Massillon. I live where I can hear the seasons change, where the dog and I can go outside side by side and strain to hear fall creeping up on summer. And yes, that is a poem about peeing outside with a dog. And you don't really want that to be the first poem that you get recognized for, but there's, you'll take it where you can get it. While we wait, we take turns tending to those who come home wounded. If you can't fight, you help who can or did. While we wait, we line the walls with muskets. Dirt floors make for uneven loading, so we leave that to the older men, the men whose question mark spines can no longer carry them across wooded lands to aim for the whites of oppressive eyes. Within the wine, there has to be a beacon. There have to be context clues. We cannot disappear into dark. We can see the misfortunate fan blades have slowed. The world is clearly visible within the wine. The drain is nearly complete. 
battery indicators all across town have begun the flicker fade into the complete curl of black. Tail lights are still, illumin still illuminated somewhere. They have to be. Warming the skin. When the sun is directly above you warming the skin, this is the only recognizable moment of your last day. Wooden plank seats have been removed, allowing you to settle into permanent sleep along the birch bark. You're back thin and flat against the water, and you rest. Little else matters than the fire. Arms folded across your heart keep the world out and form a perfect target for the flame. Just be. Every open wound, every raw nerve ending cannot be an emergency cannot mean the race to the root cellar to take shelter. After a while, the cries of wolf become white noise. After a while, the cries for mercy become easier to ignore. After a while, a skinned elbow needs to just be a skinned elbow. Thank you. The caution, children. In the green, veiny decades of the immediate past, we gave birth to the caution, children. We gave birth to the Blue Ribbon Committee of Participation is Enough. We gave birth to a double-jointed generation who flex their nonplussed shoulders, wrists, and elbows so that they can pat their unused backs, so they can pat the backs that have not learned to do it wrong and then bear the yellowed weight of their failures. They cannot disappoint. They have no expectation. The caution children chirp for figurative worms, and they are fed. The caution children each have a sign in their front yard telling the world to slow down because the caution children are at play. Thank you. Hallelujah. The mountains will crumble, rest assured. Boulders and magma and treetops and billy goats and the Dalai Lama himself will come tumbling down from on high. But I'm here to tell you something today. Yours is not the only world crumbling. The world is full of decay and fire and pain and unimaginable loss of life and love. How you get off in the dark will not matter. How you get off in the arms of another or in the arms of nobody but yourself will not matter. Your bones are turning to dust right now. Your beautiful bones are turning to dust as you take the time to hear me say this twice. Your skeleton and all the organs it protects are betraying you and your forgettable sins. Let go the keyboard, let go the fear, let go the sleepless nights and the worry. Do yourself a favor and just let go. Thank you. This poem's titled Tethered to the Template. One, this is the intro. This is as good a place to start as any, so the poem could go any place from here. It could end up floating like helium on helium, or it could end up bloated, septic, poisoned from the inside. Two, this is the body. This is the heft. This is a poem in pieces that I've always wanted to write. This is the grainy shadow circling in the apologetic sky. Three, this is the conclusion. This is the admission of guilt. This is the beaten idea corkscrewed into the muddy backyard tethered to the template. This is a voiceover narration. This is the rising crescendo and the unsurprising revelation. Thank you. Upon the hours of the day, the arteries are never susceptible to the powers of suggestion. They never bend to the will, never bother to remember the visual clues, never catch on to the contextual ones either. The deconstruction and the decomposition are too labor intensive and place too many demands upon the hours of the day. There is no time to sleep when there is rotting to be done. Thank you. There in the in-between, there are hours, thousands of them, that need to be spent slowing the world down to a processable speed. It takes some time to learn to see the action in inaction. It takes some time to learn to see that there is more to it than the wind-up and the umpire's call. There is sunlight there in the in-between. And sunlight is not mere opposite of dark. She is the brutish cleaver of the mundane and the unimaginative. She is the brilliant disguise of hiding amongst the obvious. 
Uh, this poem is The Lazy Consonants, and it's kind of a, a note to myself as a poet. Um, yeah. <laughs> the Lazy Consonants. Your voice is not as strong as you think. It is not as rough around the edges as it should be. It has been napping when you are not looking. It has been hanging out with the lazy consonants when it should have been out running with the vowels. It is tired of the same words, the same same phrasing, the same frustrated sigh between stanzas like an impatient hand on your hip. Your voice is not as strong as you think. It is rougher in some spots than it should be. It has not learned kindness. It is not bothered with swallowing pride. It bellows for the love of another, demands it, disregards what is already there. It is tired of the same words, the same same phrasing, the same frustrated sigh between stanzas like an impatient hand on your hip. It has forgotten how it got there in the first damn place. What's that? It's a bright Manella, yes. It, that's right. It's half Villanelle, half Nutella. <laughs> this poem is titled Geography Still. Shouting down the river will not bring him back. Ten years gone now and geography still is not to blame. Shouting at what is loudest and quietest both at the same time will not spin the world back. One night was all it took, yet all the angry in the world will not fill the empty seat beside you at the dinner table. All the angry in the world will not change a thing. The river is still there. The river is still quiet and loud. The river is still free where you are not. The river is not still. I've just got, uh, thank you, uh, two more poems. Uh, this one is titled Fast Last Breath. To be human is to say goodbye. Everything in this world is a beautiful reminder. The cathedral, the cancer, the crow, the crocus upon crocus, upon crocus, upon blooming crocus in the sunny early days of April. The one day last year when you didn't recognize the sag of your own face in the rigid mirror. So too is the photograph, the fire bell, the fast last breath and the look of surprise. The left turn into traffic, the left behind, the leftovers on a chipped plate in an otherwise empty refrigerator that hums too loudly as you close the door behind you. And this last poem is titled Favorites in Decomposition. Um, my mother's been getting into uh, genealogy quite a bit lately and uh, been trying to uh, tell me about the importance of, uh, of family and uh, making sure that I know where it is that I came from. Favorites in Decomposition. There are hollows bigger than tombs in my family tree. Disappearances riddle my lineage. There are names I will never know. Years I, years, I suppose, don't play favorites in decomposition. Street names and secondhand stories will have to suffice. So these I will memorize. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Steve and Az are kind of our groupie slash mascots for the team, so we love their support and we love having them around and, and support us at uh, these kinds of events. <laughs> um, so this is the Lake Effect Poetry Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. Woo! Um, we are raising money to get the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team to nationals next week in Char Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, I believe at last, last time we updated, Vertigo said we were already halfway to our goal for today, right? So um, please keep the donations coming. Um, we have a tip jar up here. If you'd like to perform, whether it's poetry, music, dancing, 
magic, puppet shows, whatever it is that you perform. If you'd like to come up to the mic, come up to the camera and perform for the coffee house and for our wonderful internet audience, um, please let us know. And um, we're taking donations if you'd like to perform today. We're also to taking donations online at lakeeffectpoetry.com, so please check that out as well. Um, and we're selling books if you're interested in uh, purchasing anything to read. So that will support us as well. I'm going to read a few of my own this time around. This is called Challenge. Black water, axes, corroded circuits, I'm an invalid watching street lamps melt a limping incandescence across the asphalt, tracing my finger along purple contours, horizon, workplace, pregnant clouds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The jazz organist rolls his upright piano across the intersection, singing for the broken, singing for the unconfirmed, singing before the harbor, announcing our severed city, scratching out stories of the plaster ghost haunting the tower and the children at war, always the children at war. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Buttonholes unravel and black corsages kneel in the road with the dirt and the blood and the money. The psychology generals intercept oaken doors hiding in their picture book warehouses, initialing contracts to Shanghai and Luzerne. With darkened ears, they can't remember autumn or stale bread or pushing the upright from the decks of ships. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Seeking answers from storms at noon in a five-piece quartet, I replace icons with gypsy moths, knowing that the elect, those who carve tattoos across their arms and shoulder blades, illustrating their unchallenged certainty, have never really met God now and at the hour of our death. Amen. if I can find it. Um, Corey Mikesell is one of our teammates who is not here right now, but I'm going to dedicate this poem to him anyway, because he is not only um, a fantastic slam poet, he's also a professional chess master. which is kind of an awesome way to make a living. And I'm sort of jealous of that. If I can find this stupid poem now. There are no page numbers on the table of contents. Why? <laughs> I don't know, I didn't make the book. There are no page numbers in the book, actually. That would be why I can't find it. Um, that's a good idea. That's why you're the smart one. <laughs> this, this is called Games. This is for Corey, wherever you are, teaching your chess lesson right now, somewhere in Northeast Ohio. <laughs> White pawn moves two spaces, dropping your brown eyes into the bottom of the mason jar, preserved along with a collection of other prayers and diamond cut baubles, folded into origami cranes, lids sealed on paper dreams to petrify into gods and servants over the winter. Black Knight moves to the center of the board, nailing iron stencils of your name across the back door after picking 30 pieces of silver from the linoleum kitchen corners from between the recliner cushions. White Bishop moves to protect Pawn, writing Olympic postcards to the stellar bears roaming nocturnally, dreaming in color, dreaming in foreign languages. Black Rook takes White Knight while I sip from a cup the color of blood, dark and spiced and wishing for something more godly, something only seen through the opposite window. White King castles with White Rook, 
starting to sing death songs with delicate iridescent wings smearing a lily dawn lest we forget that this is cancer, this is suicide, this is a quarry of chalky apathy. Black queen takes white pawn while the black sheep play in the lightless ice house where silver bats replace the starlings collecting honeycomb and crow song before leaving to pour fireflies over a grave covered in pink columbine. White knight takes black pawn, building the shrine for the hidden mockingbird and dove with the only rocks I've ever met, reciting verses from the Psalms. Black knight jeopardizes white rook, the whiteness of isolating light, the fires of ilium reflected in tonight's sunset, the kind of place your greatest need is someone's hand in yours. Checkmate, because saying goodnight always feels like the end of the world. This is a poem called Hallelujah in Three Parts. And I wrote this uh, for a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Scott Federolf, and he, he passed away a few years ago. He used to own a place in Akron called Scott's Focatorium. And the front of it was this crazy little, almost a flea market, and he sold old license plates and keychains and old books and just all kinds of random stuff, like cookie tins and, and random things that you might find at a flea market or a garage sale or anything like that. But then the coolest part was in the back of the store where he had a, a performing venue. And it was in the loading dock area. And it was just the coolest place venue ever and his his mom would would cook dinner every time they had a concert back there and they had concerts every weekend they had poetry readings back there and it was just a, a really incredible venue and uh unfortunately he ended up having to close down the place because he couldn't keep up with rent anymore and then uh he he passed away in a, a car crash shortly thereafter so i wrote this poem after he passed away and uh so this is for scott Hallelujah, number one. Blue skies, come on, tell me where you've gone. Haven't seen the sun for days, and now I'm driving darkly into the south, chasing shoeboxes full of ghosted photographs, wishing I was heading home. Blue skies, why are you hiding from the holiday hymns, from the pleading green eyes and the last chance choirs, clapping hands and dancing in the elevators all night long? Blue skies, why'd you leave us for those northern islands and the sun-spotted hills just to walk the waterfalls and the glacial rainbows with the seabirds who sing your name through those volcanic caves, through the mouth of your guitar? Blue skies, why'd you leave us with nothing but this rainy night, wishing we were going home? Blue skies, I know you've already gone home. Hallelujah, number two. They said that nobody came. He even said that nobody came, but they did come. These apprentices and knights errant came to break off sharpened fractions of their voices, sealing them inside the statuettes and colored tins to live and hum for weeks after their owners left. They came in the wake of gasoline in paper-lined weeks, visiting his harbor in the night, reflective new marble floors, signal lanterns, and ornamental brass gates. There's magic in this place, they said. And he, the presider, as sort of king among gamblers, stood on rolling red carpets, eternal, eternal, eternal. He opened the doors to living vagabonds in colored hats and dancing shoes, and he played host to the silver guardians, perched forever unseen in the rafters, but presence felt, always felt below. Hallelujah, number three. I know. I'm getting close to home when I pass that spot on the highway where the air starts to taste like metal. 11 miles of bridges and aluminum sided buses and red letter marquees. You never had a scrolling marquee. I wonder if only, I have to wonder. But tonight I drove the wrong direction, north, not south, and I doubt that I ever did right by you, that we 
ever did right by you, lying in the way that poets always have. While we waited through the fired iron and black mornings, the hollow faces looking over our shoulders for a plastic immortality, you just kept lifting up the painted wood and canvas, persistent in building your castles between the byways. And tonight, we wait while our shoes fill with rain and our eyes looking up fill with constellations, colored fables, and hope. Um, I am very extremely flattered that this next poem that I'm going to read was nominated for a Riesling Award, which, um, for those of you who don't know, it's the big sci-fi fantasy poetry award that is given out every year. And I did not win, but it was a huge, huge honor just to be nominated and to appear in the anthology. Um, and I got to be published alongside a lot of uh, famous names in the sci-fi fantasy world as well. So it's, it's pretty exciting. This is called Bridges. I wonder if they burned the bodies. After stealing the wings from their backs, peeling off those sightless cloves of color and light, I wanted to ask if they burned the bodies. Ghost miners hammer the tail feathers of doves out of scrap aluminum, gray like the stories he used to tell. But I wanted to live on a street called Imagine with the vernacular of soul sculptures tapping on the windows. And after the windows would shatter, they'd crawl, flightless and afraid of God, but at least they had something to fight against while throwing bits of monarchs at paper clouds and a paper sun. My spine melted, a candle burning a kite of red silk that never left the ground except as smoke. He touched my left shoulder blade and asked about the scars where the wings used to be. I'm sure... They're mounted on someone's wall or hanging around a duchess's neck by now. Gazing down between concrete girders and half-rusted gratings, I miss those wings, skipping over the gaps between nature and man, the intersection where a city professes its love for a cold black river. And for the first time, the first time, I feel beautiful again. What's the time look like? Six o'clock. I'll read another one or two and then we'll bring Sky back up. Okay. All right. Um, I found a lot that uh, some of the craziest, strangest poems that I write tend to happen when it's around like three or four in the morning. Oh, yeah. And this is one of those. This is called Counting Sheep, because, partially because it was written at 3 or 4 in the morning. One, the ladder of flame climbs, this trellis of orange roses sucking the April light from the witching tower. Periwinkle windows fall sequentially, extinguished, extinguished, all the yellow coronets trumpet, extinguished. Stella, Luna, Stella, Luna. Two, three, queen carnation red thorns hover in a mock chalice and 50 parchment scrabbles, shelter colloquialisms. Heaven sent the metonymous clockworks. Heaven sent these paper bags. Three, four, and still the shorthand kerfuffle scoggamuffin adaptations of gerrymandering monsters, bilious and silver-throated Shanghai, our diamond-studded Oxfords clucking hello to the basket weavers and cinnamon sticks. Four, five, breakdancing lemmings, hello and hello, they twilight tumble next year's somersault, salting ash, peppering landscape, watching towers shivering while the white pines reach for an, an embrace. Six, six, seven, God is good, God is good. Every purple hooded single file child rants, God is good in this electron motivation. 
Sucre, bribes, and shallot oil threaten fingertip stains, bloody, bloody little fingertip stains. Oh, Gehenna's marbles, glassy cat's eyes trickle, dribble from the tongue. Eight loamy headed monsters clatter, yarn weaving sheets and sheets of totem pole translations, emeraldic glorias mess up the streets. Yes, and an egg shaped promise that I do not believe. Nine. Furtive, ten, fugitive, eleven, blackening the ash trees, burn them all to save them. Where are the shields, the still-coated linings? I have failed tonight. There are no crosshatch fairies. The golem have died. Twelve, shifting butter in seamstresses, this diction, this logos in a saffron decanter wrapped in oilcloth and pushed and folded like a paper boat out, 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 blue ribbon prizes, every one of them, 13 unbleached nations, seaside pomegranates, meaning, meaning? What meaning? Your earbud fan frenzy laser disc competition, that's the only thing that matters across a terry cloth pastry shell. No more, no more. Fourteen, fourteen, I am the number fourteen. Um, so those are all from uh, my chapbook, Hurricane of Moths. And next up we have our teammate, Skylark Bruce. This is the Sunday Fun Day Fund Drive, for those who have not yet heard that or need to be reminded. We are raising money for the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team to go to the National Poetry Slam in a week from tomorrow. So we desperately need your donations. So if you are interested in performing a song, a poem, um, a hula hoop dance, a pantomime, anything that you would like to come up and share with us, you know, do so for a donation or just donate. That's pretty cool, too. Um, I have a couple of more pieces that I will be reading. Good morning, madam. I'm from Integrator Remembrance Services. I am the advice solicitor. How are you today? Wonderful. I'm fabulous. Why am I standing here at your front door? Well, I'm here to solicit all your unsolicited advice. I will take all the ugly, painful words that people have heaped upon you. A busybody offered you a comment you just didn't appreciate? I collect those. Interlopers meddling in your business? Bring it all here. I can make it all go away. The aggravation will soon be the faintest memory. A dream within a dream from a fortnight ago. A condescen the condescension will trouble you no more. My automobile is outfitted with the advice incinerator. Witness for yourself the power of the combustor of comments, the smelter of memories. For a modest fee, you can experience the same joy as, as Mrs. Claudia Jensen of Milwaukee, whose pregnancy exhausted her far less than the wisdom that friends and family heaps upon her. Gone. Forgotten. Whisked away. Never recalled again. Mr. Daniel Allen in Raleigh also attests to the happiness of life beyond harassment. Strangers often verbally attack him on the street for his odd appearance, but the recollection troubles him no more. At my low prices, you can wipe away the social misery of not just the past week, but the last month, quarter, and year as well. If the verbal sticks and stones of your school days still haunt you, I can exterminate those pesky cockroaches too. I can make it all go away. I offer a priceless service, but it comes at a price. For every piece of advice I solicit from you, you lose an undesired comment to give another. In exchange for others holding their tongues, you will have to restrain yours. When people badger you for your opinion, you will not be able to give it. You'll be able to discuss ideas, of course, but you will not be able to give advice. The words will catch in your rib cage. The more you try to rest the syllables up your throat, the more you will asphyxiate on the sounds. 
To avoid looking like a suffocating fool, you will soon, soon learn to listen silently, while others tell their tales of woe. Consider carefully. The sting of snide remarks aimed at you will be gone, but so as well the knowledge you would foist on others. I'm the advice solicitor from Integrated Remembrance Services, and I can make it all go away. Thank you. <clears throat> they whispered about her behind demure hands, over submissive skirts and under long braided helpmeet hair. They ruminated on the rebel among them. Sally was the loudest of the homeschooled girls, the one who put wayward boys in their places without hesitation. This did not make her popular among the males in the insulated community, but the girls. Oh, the girls. They were good Christian girls, too polite for public solidarity, but they were captivated by her unconcerned courage. They murmured quietly so dads and big brothers wouldn't hear. Sally was only partially aware of her status. She just did what came naturally, and her backbone automatically rejected any attempts to doormat her. The girls spoke of her oddness, but no one spoke of being queer. Faith fancied her beyond what she'd ever declare with words. Sally inspired Faith to join in with her goofy comments during worship services, though Faith could never announce her not just platonic love for Sally. She could have fainted in bliss for one kiss with the whirlwind Sally, but the cost was too high. The price of passion would have left her penniless and more importantly, without a family. She would have withered into red dust if Sally had outright rejected her, but she knew if Sally returned the sentiments, her family would seek to expunge the evil from their midst. So Faith hated the glow that warmed her insides when Sally was around. No one could know the malignant abomination of the world had an unwelcome home in her soul as well. For Sally's part, she assumed that Faith's adoring glances and appreciative comments sprang from a place of platonic admiration. Sally would not recognize bisexuality in the mirror for years later, nor did she dream that she was the silent love interest of a terrified homeschool lesbian. It was a failed male suitor of Faith who became platonic friends with Sally as adults who informed the oblivious idol of the situation. Jim confided in Sally that every time Faith had said Sally's name or spoke of her at all, Faith had radiated such scintillating joy that he knew. He knew the love of his teenage life would only ever see him as a consolation prize instead of Sally. It had twisted his gut with jealousy, but he was married to Jennifer now, so it was mere amusement to speak of past things. He reminded her how Faith had never called anyone a kindred spirit besides her. The muted tones of the obedient evangelical woman took on a new flavor for Sally, and she wondered. Their older queer counterparts in homeschoolerville had fallen like cakes in the oven, settling for either faux marriages to men or resigned singleness. The world spun forward on its axis outside the homeschool community doors. Queer kids would have to leave to find affirmation. They were turned to visit only when they can compartmentalize. Family over here, sexuality over there. Never the twain shall meet. Perhaps in another homeschool cluster elsewhere, education at home does not include lessons in lesbian self-loathing and admonitions to pray the gay away. Bisexuals, pansexuals, and asexuals count themselves as blessings there rather than diseased menaces to Christian society. Their preachers praise straight parents who love their queer children without condition, saying, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Thank you. We have more donations. Sweet. Ooh, somebody bought 40 minutes, so we're going to hear a lot of somebody. Who is this mysterious donor? Russell and who? Oh, then I'll read another poem until he comes back in. <laughs> Smile! Hey girl, smile! Why the serious face, woman, smile! Smile, smile, smile. Strangers think they own my face, but I don't remember selling it to them. I like to smile. I smile as often as I want to, which makes people wonder what I'm thinking. 
Sometimes when I'm concentrating hard, my smile runs off my face and into my brain to help. This is usually when some douchebag I've never met before decides that my expression isn't good enough for him. Smile and the world smiles with you. But he won't do the smiling. Somehow I have to smile for both of us. Cheer up, girl! If he said hello and smiled at me in the first place, I'd probably return the greeting gladly. Hey, lady, smile for me. Perhaps the most annoying are those who tell me to smile when I'm already smiling. Do they even look at me before ordering me around? Turn that frown upside down. One day at work, I was handing a lollipop to a toddler laughing and smiling when a man came out of nowhere and pounded his fist on my desk. Smile. I'm not sure if that was worse than the week before when a man spent several minutes trying to convince me that the repetitive task I was doing that I didn't actually mind was on par with concentration camp torture. Can't win. Smile, baby. Perk up, honey. It's nearly always men who tell women to smile. I guess men's faces actually belong to men. We should redefine orders to smile as sexist street harassment, along with wolf whistles and hay babies and stranger ass grabs. It's not a compliment. It's not mere attraction. It's not a guy thing. Refusing to carry an umbrella is a guy thing. They want to see me as a good girl, always cheerful and bubbly to soothe the woes that only they have. Teach me to be a submissive, grinning girl, a coy customer server of cheer, a marionette for them to manipulate. And I'll do it with a smile on my face. Is our 40-minute person here ready to perform? Okay. This is the Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive.